Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is afternoon. Yeah, welcome to the session. Uh, you've probably, if you're interested in books, either read or at least at the very least heard about Sharmishta's book. It's been a literary sensation. It's been a political sensation. But I think, and she can disagree with me, it's often been in the news for the wrong reasons. So I thought we'd focus on some of the real revelations and some of the insights in the book. I wanted to start with the first wrong reason. Many people, when I said I was doing this interview with you, said, has she joined the BJP? So I said, no, there's no question of her joining the BJP. So they said, hasn't she just written this book to badmouth the Gandhis and join the BJP? You got a lot of that, didn't you, when the book came out? Absolutely. And going by the social media, I mean, I was trolled pretty badly. And everybody, uh, including some of my friends in Congress, uh, they were convinced that I'm joining BJP. But, you know, I had quit politics in 2022. And I have no intention of joining any political party. And my uh, loyalties are towards my father. And, you know, I have tried my best to... I primary source material from for this book are his diaries yeah. and uh, so my loyalties are towards him and what I felt what how I interpreted you know what he felt thought about certain people I wrote that because uh, I felt as a writer as a daughter that is what it is it is neither towards Sonia Gandhi or not towards Narendra Modi so that is what and I think anybody who bothers to read the book uh, would see that, uh, you know, I mean, he was a hardcore Congress person and uh, it totally comes out. And certain criticisms of Congress and including some of the members of the Gandhi family, what comes, that is after, you know, uh, his immense political experience and this all comes after his, uh, you know, during his retirement age and actually literally after, you know, like one of his last entries, just before a month of passing away, you know, he wrote about, you know, the downfall of Congress, his analysis of it, and he also held himself responsible for it. So this is comes coming out from the anguish of a hardcore, lifelong Congress person, not to criticize any particular person or any particular family. So this is, it should be taken in that perspective. And while you say that your father was at a personal level, very fond of the Prime Minister and they got along very well and the Prime Minister gave him enormous respect. There's never any doubt about where his and your political hearts lie because you talk about the attempt to eliminate the legacy of Nehru and you say that's impossible. You talk about secularism, you talk about the things that made India great and that commitment is there on every page. So how did this BJP stuff start? Nothing. I think, uh, you know, today, to be very honest, uh, uh, Mr. Sangvi, I don't know how many people actually read a book. I'm not talking about this crowd out here, but... Probably <laughs> the wrong thing to say in literary <laughs> festival, but still, yeah. But actually, you know, they just go by the headlines, they go by the tweets, uh, and they jump to conclusions. And that is what, you know, I had uh, been, you know, trying to convince some people, you know, I mean, as at least read the book and then come to your conclusion. Just don't, you know, go by the highlights of the media. You know, media pick up anything, you know, what they think is going to create a controversy. And uh, so that's it. But I think, you know, one should read the book and one should, you know, judge it by himself rather than what media say about it or anybody else have any other kind of presumptions, preconceived notions about the books. Now, because the media focused so much on your joining the BJP and your alleged attacks on the Gandhi family, which frankly are not there, though at the final stages one gets the impression you're a bit irritated with Rahul Gandhi, but apart from that, there's nothing really to the sensations and the rumours that were started in the book. They missed what I thought was the big revelation, which is that your father wanted to give the Bharat Ratana to Manmohan Singh. Absolutely. He felt that, you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh's uh, uh, contribution in uh, growth of uh, Indian economy has been tremendous and he wanted to confer Bharat Ratna to him. And uh, in one of his diaries uh, entries, I still remember 30th October uh, 2013, um, he wrote that, you know, he spoke to the, the cabinet secretary to talk to Pulak Chatterjee, who was the principal secretary to the prime minister then, and to uh, uh, ask Pulak to talk to Sonia Gandhi and ascertain uh, her views about it. 
but uh, after that there was no further reference to it so i really don't know what transpired whether actually cabinet secretary must have talked to pulak chatterjee because an instruction coming from the president uh, could not be ignored but what transpired after that did pulak conveyed this to sonia ji or uh, what happened so that i am not aware about but this shows that you know like my father you know like he always maintained publicly privately that he was whatever he was because of indira gandhi yeah. his great regards for pandit nehru he was a hardcore nehru bhai you know it is i mean they are in i mean 2000 speeches in public domain he had a very good uh, warm working relationship with sonia gandhi uh, are these people not part of congress he has tremendous respect for dr manmohan singh leave aside certain you know differences uh, in terms of maybe uh, their ideas about you know certain policies that is for working for so many years together under such high pressure uh, conditions you know there are bound to be some kind of uh, you know these kind of differences but it cannot be denied that they had tremendous respect for each other and that is why my father wanted to confer bharat ratna to uh, dr manmohan singh doesn't dr manmohan singh belong to congress so why shouldn't these praises for these leaders should not be you know taken as praise for congress and just criticism of one particular uh, uh, you know a much younger person than mr pranab mukherjee uh, uh, why should just criticism of rahul gandhi and say that you know he is yet to mature politically you know coming from one of the and this observation coming from one of the most astute politicians of his generation why should be taken as a criticism rather i think you know it should have uh, you know the current band of congress leaders they should have been graceful about it and said yes this advice is coming from a very senior leader of our party who is no more so and and this observation was also made about 11 12 years back you know i mean when he wrote it in his diaries and all Definitely. so why should that criticism of one particular person be so much blown out of proportion that it should be taken uh, as uh, criticism of congress you know no political no not one political leader is kind of synonymous with congress you know i think high time the Ex congress except, workers should except also. for indira gandhi judging by your father's book sorry except for indira gandhi judging by your father's book i mean he doesn't seem to make a distinction between her and the congress yes i guess yeah, so yeah. my father was like absolutely Uh, uh, a blind devotee i yeah. would say of indira gandhi because she was his mentor but about her also you know like towards the end of his life as i say that about just about a month before his passed away uh, passed away he passed away on 31st august uh, 2020 i think around 28th july so there is this long entry in his uh, diary uh, about how he felt even you know the actual uh perhaps uh, weakening of congress started during indira ji's time uh, because due to two split engineered by her and the whole concentration of power centralization of power it started during indira ji's time so i mean somewhere you know and he also held resp himself responsible for this and people like him he said aren't we people like aren't, am i not or people like me are responsible for mortgaging the interest of the congress party to the family and by allowing it to make it uh, uh, a fiefdom of uh, the gandhi nehru family so i think this kind of concerns have been raised by many people including for example historian ram goha he had been saying this so i think it took my father many years uh, of his political journey and at the fag end of it yes when he did not have Uh, much to do he was leading a retired life so obviously at that time a person tend to uh, introspect and he was very disturbed about uh, the present condition of congress he was very very disturbed that how could and many entries you know from his diaries i have quoted that how could the uh, grand old party you know has fallen to that state so naturally a person would introspect and also would see his own responsibility in this whole journey and rather than taking it as a criticism i think it is a point every congress supporter including myself i am a hardcore congress supporter no matter anybody <laughs> can say any damn thing sorry for using such language but uh, i also think that what has gone wrong and you know yeah. and what i mean i am no longer actively involved in politics but as a citizen of the country what can i do to mend it
Definitely, I think about that. I am worried about that. Now, if you read reviews of the book or tweets about the book, the suggestion is that because you weren't intimately involved in his politics, this is just stuff that a daughter gleaned on the breakfast table or the dining table from her father. But it's not. I mean, the book is based on his diaries. And his diaries are incredibly detailed and they have not been revealed before. So tell us about his diaries. Yes, there are 51 volumes and he has had the habit of writing diaries since his childhood. And many of, it, uh, many of them are lost. And the earliest one I have, I got is about, uh, I think, 73, uh, 1973. And in between also, somewhere the early periods of 1980s, uh, they were lost because due to a flooding of our basement uh, in our uh, residence in Delhi where all the old diaries were kept. So, but still there are 51 volumes and uh, they are pretty detailed. But again, they are not because, uh, uh, you know, there are many references I really could not understand. And before joining politics, uh, I was a Kathak dancer and choreographer by profession. So, the world of politics was totally, in a way, I was just not interested in politics. Then I joined politics in 2014, and that is the time also my father started talking in detail uh, about his journey, about his, I would ask him questions. So a serious conversation about politics started pretty late in my life. So many are things in his diaries I really could not understand because, for example, he say wrote today Jain Commission, Jain Committee report was tabled in Parliament and there was an uproar. So now, what is that Jain Committee report? <laughs> you know, I was clueless. You really so, didn't know? No, at that time I didn't okay. know. You know, but then I did my own research and uh, you know, uh, find out. So there are many things. Obviously, uh, just by the first reading, I could not understand. And as I say, you know, fifty. It's not possible to write everything written in a fifty-one volume yeah, diary. But probably that will take you know volumes of books. So you know, these are my own pers lack of you know very limited knowledge. Of, uh, you know, is also one of the, one of the problems. But as oh, I but, say, but you know, sorry, this but sorry, just because the example you gave, Jain Commission report was tabled, suggests that these are diaries that just report what happened. But they're not. They're much more personal. It is, I went to see Mrs. Gandhi. She was very angry. She shouted at me. I went to see Sonia. She said she respected me very much and would not manage without me. Usually this means that something bad is coming. It's full of this kind of insight. Of course. You know, like a diary, a person is pouring out his heart. It's a very, very intimate uh, document. And there, you know, you write, I mean, in his diaries, there are, you know, mentions about his daily engagements. Uh, there are mentions about his conversations uh, about different political leaders. There are mentions about his own insight, about his own views about certain things. Uh, there are, you know, uh, he, he was a history buff. So any institution he visited, for example, you know, like uh, he would write the history about it. For example, I came to know that the income tax was actually started uh, somewhere during the, uh, uh, the, the uh, oh my God, memory is getting, uh, the East India Company he times, you know, and after the, uh, the first war of independence, it was levied uh, by the East India Company to recover the cost of the war. And that was the beginning of income, income tax. So I came to know about it from my father's diaries. So there are various, but, it's a very no, thing. But nobody read the diaries while he was alive? No, no, no. It was totally out of bound and uh, he told uh, many people, including some of the journalists, that the diary, he's going to leave the diaries with uh, his uh, daughter. Uh, but uh, I can also, uh, I mean, he told me very specifically that I can read them only after he uh, passes away. And I respected that uh, feeling and uh, so nobody... Uh, Naturally, again, as I say, if I had the habit of writing diaries, I don't think I would allow anybody to read it, you know. Also, let's talk about certain key relationships that he talks about in the book. We all know he was very close to Indira Gandhi. There's a story in the book, for those of you who haven't read it, when in 1980, Pranam Mukherjee decided to stand for election to the Lok Sabha. Everybody told him he would lose. His family told him he would lose. His wife told him, don't stand. Mrs. Gandhi said, don't stand. But as she will attest, Pranamda was nothing if not stubborn. So he duly went and stood. And of course, he lost. And when he, Mrs. Gandhi then called him back. And then 
dressed him down and said, how dare you go and do this? And he kept standing. And Sanjay Gandhi entered the room and said, let him sit down at least, mummy. And she said no, and she kept shouting. So it was a really, I mean, first of all, he's recorded this, which is unusual. So it was a relationship of affection. She treated him almost like a younger brother, no? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you know this particular incident, uh, uh, I mean, because the diaries from that period were lost. Yeah. But this story, I mean, we have heard really? millions of times at home. Like this was one of his, I think, favorite stories that uh, it is, uh, you know, how uh, Indira Gandhi literally scolded him. Uh, and um, and with, I think, you know, his uh, relationship with Indraji was like uh, really unique. I mean, she also taught him how to dress. You know, my father came from a very, very ordinary family from rural Bengal. And for the first time, actually, he visited Delhi in 1969 to take oath in the parliament as a Rajya Sabha member. Before that, he never even stepped out of yeah. Bengal. And in those days, he used to wear this either dhoti kurta or these half sleeve shirts and trousers. And so when he became a deputy minister somewhere in, I think, 1972, so Indiraji uh, that time called him for a meeting and uh, he walked into her office uh, wearing his usual, I think, half sleeve shirt and trousers. Trouser. So she told him that, you know, Pradab, now you have to dress more formally. You are a minister, you have to meet to, you know, have various formal meetings. So you, and not only that, not only she uh, ticked him, but she also called up my father, my mother personally and said, you know, get some nice suits, bangala suits stitched for him. So it was that kind of a relationship. She, she also asked him to get a tutor. You yes. Know. You know, my father's uh, English pronunciation was like really Bengali accented, you know, like thick Bengali accent. So many a times Indiraji told him that, you know, why don't you keep a tutor? It will do you world of God. So my father, after a few times, uh, got a bit irritated and said, ma'am, ma'am, you can't square a circle. I am whatever I am. You have to uh, accept me as I am. So, I mean, you know, it's but this apparently kind of... She, I mean, he once told me, Shreya himself, mm -hmm. that he was once asked to move the economic resolution at some, maybe the AICC or somewhere, and it was in Hindi. And he said, Madam, I can't do it because my Hindi is bad. So she said, yeah, and you think your English is any good? So they, <laughs> used, to, so they, used, so they used to keep talking like that. Yes. That on one occasion, this is in your book, when he made quite a long speech as finance minister, she said, the longest speech made by the shortest finance minister. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So that was a relationship of such affection that he remembered these jokes. He held no malice. There was no malice in them. He held no ill will towards her. Absolutely. You know, as, as I said, and my father always, uh, you know, mentioned it both uh, many a times to us, uh, uh, you know, and full of these kind of stories. And uh, he always said that, you know, it, it was thanks to Indiraji, you know, who taught him intricacies of politics, of diplomacy, and also gave him responsibilities. Gave him responsibilities and, you know, like going through well, my He father's was number two. What? Number two, he became later, you know, in this, like, af after, I mean, 1980, when uh, the... But even before that, even as a junior minister in uh, her government, I mean, I found papers, you know, pertaining to different ministries, which were kind of, uh, he was asked to look into, about party-related matters. You know, uh, letters from, uh, say, uh, somebody from Andhra Pradesh, uh, or even Northeast, Northeast, yeah. he was very, uh, uh, quite yeah. intimately uh, involved with. So, it seems that Indira Gandhi was involving him far beyond the, than the right. scope of his formal uh, duties and responsibilities as a minister. Okay. So, so, I think that was a kind of bond and that is the because of that he was given the opportunity. It was a bond beyond politics. Yes, no? definitely, definitely. Which brings us to the obvious thing, that's one of the more controversial aspects of his life and you've dealt with it quite thoroughly. I mean, for those of who, you who don't know, Pranam Mukherjee was in Bengal when Mrs. Gandhi was shot. So was Rajiv Gandhi. They both went to Calcutta airport. A special plane was chartered. They went in that plane. I think, Ra from what I remember, Rahul Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi went into the cockpit, was told that she'd been declared death, th dead, though they'd heard this from the BBC, came out and announced this to people. Pranam Mukherjee says, and he said this in your book as well, burst into tears because he was really overwrought. 
now what happens next is where the controversy begins it's been suggested by various people that be beneath that grief he actually sensed an opportunity and thought he would become interim prime minister now it's not in the book but i do know for a fact that he issued instructions that the service chiefs the cabinet secretary and the home secretary should come to the airport to receive the plane he says it wasn't to receive him it was to receive rajiv gandhi to make sure that some order was maintained unfortunately a story then went around that pradam mukherjee was trying to take over now it suggests in the book which i didn't know that the story was possibly spread by gani khan choudhury you cuz you blame barkat as the villain most people say that there was already a problem between pranab mukherjee and arun nehru and arun nehru said to rajiv don't you see this guy is trying to take over we must keep him at arm's length what do you think happened yeah this is something you know my father had written i found after his uh, passing away in his uh, um papers that he has written a very very lengthy note yeah. uh, explaining the happenings uh, of the day and most of it he has used it in his memoirs also in his written by him and some of the fill in the blanks uh, you know where for example in his own memoir he did not blame barkat yeah. but uh, i felt that you know he thought rightly or wrongly that it was barkat who uh, who uh, planted the story uh, because of the reason that barkat it seems suggested in the plane in that there was a discussion with balram thakur barkat gani khan choudhury and a couple of others people uma shankar dikshit was there uh, saying that you know uh, when rajiv's name cro cropped up uh, popped up so uh, he said that how can a outsider because rajiv was not a member of cabinet then that how can an outsider uh, be the prime minister and he also said that let's wait till delhi and either if among one of the current members of the cabinet uh, needed to take over it should be either you or pv narsimha rao so perhaps <coughs> you know barkat let of i mean it's all conjec conjectures we don't know but that you know if this story would have come out barkat would have been in trouble so perhaps he you know but Take what care. you are saying is yeah. also there that you know he instructed he told rajiv to ask the pilot to send a message to yeah. the cabinet secretary and all to come uh, and not to receive anybody but just to you know find out that what is happening yeah. and you know i mean what are the next steps to be taken like that because he had the administrative experience yeah. and this and plus also uh what he felt what my father felt that during the two months of working together as rajiv as prime minister you know before the next election that is the time perhaps uh, rajiv felt that pranam mukherjee doesn't tow lines very easily and my anybody you know familiar with my father would i think agree that you know it was difficult to argue with him because his argument would be backed with very strong you know not only just logic but uh, facts and figures precedents so you know he would not accept uh, something just because somebody is saying it and uh, so he wrote this he wrote this that you know in our two months of working together rajiv perhaps felt that i am a tough nut to crack that is i have quoted yeah. him so i think in a personality centered centered political culture uh the supreme leaders might find it a bit irksome to work with somebody uh, who has a mind a very strong mind of his or her own backed with a formidable combination of experience expertise and knowledge that kind of person can never blindly toe the line so i think that was one of the reason of uh, why Ra rajiv was apprehensive uh, uh, and of uh, uh, course you know there are you know issues of you know arun uh, uh, nehru yeah i'm i'm going to stop you yes, on that because you're yes. you've been skirting around that yeah. one suggestion is that when mrs gandhi was alive arun nehru was one of her primary advisors in he and rajiv would try and suggest things to mrs gandhi and contrary to the impression we have that mrs gandhi only listened to her family she would run things by pranab mukherjee by r k dhawan by gyani zail singh by many people who were close to her if you look at what happens in the rajiv gandhi prime ministership shortly after he takes over uh, pranab mukherjee is dropped from the cabinet his full fledged cabinet 
Dhawan is actually framed bizarrely enough by Arun Nehru for the murder of Indira Gandhi and Yani Zail Singh he gets into a huge fight with. So there was that element of Arun Nehru carrying on a grudge from before because Arun Nehru then is thrown out of the government and guess what, Pranam Mukherjee is back in favour and he becomes Rajiv Gandhi's primary economic advisor. So you think that had something to do with it? Yes, obviously. You know, like in my book I have written in detail, you know, these kind of things are never monocausal. Yeah. There are multiple factors. So, you know, I think my father's own personality trait, his non-subservient attitude towards, uh, um, you know, Rajiv uh, in his initial uh, years, I mean, uh, Arun Nehru and Rajiv's close coterie, uh, who were primarily non-political people. I mean, other than Arun Nehru, uh, there was there's this. Another interesting thing I r read yeah. in his, that uh, in 1982, 83, as a finance minister then, you know, he introduced this NRI portfolio investment. Yeah. And that created a, a tussle between uh, Swaraj Paul, who was feared to be taken over, taking over uh, this DCM and this Rajan Nanda's escorts. And uh, there was a lot of uh, issues at that time. And Rajan Nanda was a close personal friend uh, in the Rajiv Gandhi circle. And uh, th in a parliament debate, uh, Rajiv Gandhi said that the NRI investment total should not exceed between two per more than 2 percent. Whereas then my father in consultation with uh, Indiraji uh, made it 5 percent. So he felt, my father felt that perhaps you know, this also could be one of the reasons why Ra Rajiv's yeah. friends were unhappy with him. Yeah. So there are various reasons, you but know. And despite what you say about top leaders not liking a tough nut. The truth is that when Rajiv was out of power, it was your father, not Chidambaram, who was his primary economic advisor. And had Rajiv lived, your father would have been finance minister. I think he said so to many people, he said so to me. He was quite clear about that. So if Pranam Mukherjee had come back as finance minister in 1991. And remember, he contributed a lot to the Congress manifesto in that election, which talked about liberalization. Would we have seen the liberalization of 1991? Or would it, he have stopped short? You know, that is uh, something I really can't answer. Because firstly, it's too speculative. And secondly, my own, uh, own understanding of economics and financial matters is absolutely zilch. So, this is something I have never even talked about uh, with my father and like or, even… Or mentioned in the book which I found interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know this is something I really don't understand. I have never even studied economics in my school. So, I really <laughs> don't okay. understand this. Okay. Uh, so, that's why you know like uh, uh, okay. I, I can't okay. speculate All right. All right. but one… Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll take it further. The finance minister then became Manmohan Singh who went on to become a great public hero. Manmohan Singh later went on to become Prime Minister, which I think your father had expected because Sonia had made that clear. Your father then worked as finance, uh, as external, as what, Defence Minister and various other portfolios including Finance Minister under a man who had reported to him when he was Governor of the Reserve Bank and your father was Finance Minister. Yet, until this whole uh, retrospective tax thing which we'll deal with later comes along, there never seems to have been the slightest problem between them. How was that? I think it was simply because of the extraordinary courtesy Dr. Manmohan Singh treated my father with. And I have heard this from in, including some of the senior journalists that even when Dr. Manmohan Singh became uh, the Prime Minister, he initially would address my father as Sir. Yeah. And my father had to point it out to him many a times that, you know, you can't address me as sir because you are the prime minister. This is totally against protocol. So it was like, I think they had immense respect for each other. And uh, I mean, and the glimpses of it are uh, even as early as during Narsimha Rao's time when my uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was the finance minister and my father was the deputy chairperson of planning commission. Even at that time, you know, there is an entry that the finance minister came to meet him and uh, regarding some resource allocation or something. And uh, the, my, my father wrote that, you know, he said, Dr. quoting Dr. Manmohan Singh, he said that uh, uh, you are my minister once, whatever you say, that is final. And then my father concluded, what a gentleman he is.
so and any discussion i have had with my father you know about dr manmohan singh it will always be you know either begin with or end with that he is a true gentleman Okay. and which is which is true i think maybe that is a, one of the reason that because there was a genuine respect about each other and about you know dr manmohan singh or about sonia gandhi also my father told me many times that yes you know working under such high pressure condition it is possible that you know many a times we disagree and he always used to say that you know like you don't need to agree on everything every time that was one of his very favorite uh, uh, you know uh, sayings so obviously you know there are bound to be differences of opinion but i think you know the most important is that they knew to how to handle the differences yeah that is the thing that collapses in upa 2 no in one of the things that collapses about i mean collapses about many things one of them is the fact that by upa 2 you you written about arvind kejriwal who is clearly not your favorite person and you written about the anna hazare movement and you've said that the government really didn't know how to cope what you've left out is that during that period the government was actually run by groups of ministers rather than the cabinet and your father headed more groups of ministers than anybody else that because manmohan singh was in this shell wouldn't take decisions which your father had written about in his book wouldn't come out your father and ahmed patel would meet every night and try try and do crisis management try and handle things you played that down in the book why uh, not exactly <coughs> but uh, i mentioned about the fact that you know he headed a large number of gm gms and all but you know this book the focus of the book was primarily on his uh, personal and political journey and uh, of course my relationship my experience of growing up and it was primarily about his relationship with uh, the key people that is the prime ministers he has worked with i have really left out pranam mukherjee as an administrator okay. pranam mukherjee as a parliamentarian you know those aspects you know perhaps i will write about in another book but as i said that you know like 51 volumes of uh, uh, yeah, yeah. diaries it yeah. is not uh, okay. possible okay. another mm. thing you haven't written about is when the congress went in after upa won for an election most people thought the congress would be lucky to do as well as it had done at the last election it was clear that the left was not going to support manmohan singh as prime minister in case the left was needed again there was very strong speculation that your father would be the prime minister in that case in fact during upa 2 also within the government there was a strong move to bring your father in as prime minister and send manmohan singh to rashtrapati bhavan it never happened you don't deal that much with it you deal with the rashtrapati bhavan aspect but not the prime minister aspect you know to be very honest you know i have also read about it from others account but from my father's diaries i haven't got any indication of that okay you know i mean uh, so there was no indication that there were such moves happening and all but because perhaps somewhere i think he knew very well that you know these are all speculations and he was a seasoned politician yeah. so he also knew uh perhaps so i really haven't didn't find uh, any such okay. indication in his book okay. diaries the other relationship which became increasingly important over time and is probably still worth of interest is the relationship between your father and mamata banerji you write that mamata banerji would come to your house would have dinner you would all treat her like a close friend and yet politically she more than anyone else did her best to damage your father why I really don't know. You know, this is one thing I have failed to understand, and especially, you know, like with Mamta, uh, Mamta Di. You know, I have seen that uh, uh, one is a personal aspect which I have written about in the book, and another is the political aspect of it, which, to be very honest, I came to know about it much more in detail, not only from Baba's diaries, but from my own research while I was writing this book. but it came as a major surprise to me and still i fail to understand that what political motivation did mamta had opposing my father's presidential candidate well, wasn't yeah. just that she opposed him for everything no she when she left the congress she when she yeah. left the congress she said pranab mukherjee drove me out no when she left acha in the yeah. 1990s yeah. Yeah. yes that was one time you know when she felt that you know there was uh, Uh, uh internal election organizational election um, in congress for the pcc president 
and Shomen Mitra defeated her by a very few votes. But somehow she always held Pranam Mukherjee responsible for that. And Mamata's biographer, I mean one uh, Shutapa Paul, you know, I read in her book that perhaps Mamata Banerjee could never forgive Pranam Mukherjee for that. I personally find it a bit difficult to digest because that happened somewhere in yeah. 1990s. Yeah. You know, but yes, from my father's diaries, I could make out that it is a bit of a uh, stormy relationship and uh, especially during UPA 1, uh, sorry, UPA 2, when uh, Mamta was uh, part of the government. So, you know, I, she would uh, throw tantrums, she would, uh, I mean, that's my father. So, once, a, a couple of times I asked her, especially uh, during, uh, uh, that why she opposed, why, while she was opposing. Uh, Baba's presidential. I said, why is she doing that? Yeah. You know, because that time I was under the impression that they had a very good yeah. relationship and she might be throwing tantrums, but I mean, okay, that's fine, you know. So he just laughed and said that she is like that, you know, but she will support me at the end. So he was quite confident about it that, you know, he will. But why she, you know, opposed it? Is it because of just personal grievance? Or is there any, was there any political motivation behind it? Still, I really don't know. So that I remains mean, one of the great mysteries of Bengal politics. Right? <laughs> I guess. I mean, yeah. and, and to me also personally. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm going to throw this open to questions. Please put your hand up. Stand up. Identify yourself when I recognize you and ask your question. The gentleman there at the back here with his hand up. We'll give you a microphone, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Shantanu Sirpray. Hi. Ask your question. I appreciate all the anecdotes, but in my world of venture capital and private equity, Mr. Mukherjee is known for one thing, retroactive taxation, which killed private equity in India for five years. And now there was a move now to uh, redact that act. So I, it's, been, it's been a very popular act for people in my world. Yeah. So Sorry, have you read the book? Have I've you read the book. You read the book? I've not. Okay, read the book because there's 20, uh, 20 pages on it. But I'll ask her in summary. You've done a long defense of that decision, so just explain it. Not really. Okay. I, again, as I said, that, you know, this is something, one area I really don't understand. And that's why I never even talked about it with my father. But, you know, because he would get very irritated and don't snap Don't understand. At me. You've written 20 pages about that it. That is later. I did too. I had to read. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. I had to do a lot of studies okay. on okay. it. Okay. You know? One thing, you know, I mean, I give my father's own justification of it, that just because a deal is structured outside, you know, as the properties are involved, you know, the assets involved, Indian assets, so nobody can evade taxation. So it was bringing at power. And why at, uh, why retrospection? Because it seems before the Supreme Court uh, final judgment, in an, first the High Court, there was a Bombay High Court judgment, and then an interim uh, uh, ordered by the Supreme Court that favored no, hang, the government. Hang on. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll ask you what he was going to ask, which is that the Bombay High Court, Justice Chandrachud was the judge, ruled against Vodafone. Yeah. The Supreme Court overruled Chandrachud yeah. and said that there was no question of taxation. Your father, that, uh, given this, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister U UK at the time, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of India saying that I've heard this judgment be overturned. The Prime Minister wrote to him to say there is no question, we don't believe in retrospective, etc. After which your father said, I'm going to do retrospective taxation. Manmohan Singh begged him not to do it. Sonia Gandhi begged him not to do it. All of industry, as he will tell you, begged him not to do it. But he wouldn't listen. Why? Well, I don't know why he wouldn't okay. listen. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I just think I can only give the justification what he wrote in his book because he wanted to bring trans uh, this uh, the parity. No, 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 but you have and, a good point about but, how. But you know, one yeah. point what yeah. I found, you know, through my very limited understanding, what I listened that you know this will stop foreign investment. Okay, so this is what, but. Going by the Modi government, you know, from 2015 onwards, they are claiming that there is the foreign investment during their regime is much more than the UP1 to put together. Now, retrospective tax was very much there till 2022. So, on one hand, you know, you say that there would not be any FDs. On the other hand, you claim that there are record FDs 
despite the present existence of retrospective tax, this is something I found contradictory. And this is the only thing I understood about it and this is the thing I wrote in my book. Beyond this, to be very honest, I don't understand. Okay. We'll take another. I'll take you up on that later. Go on. I don't something. There's a gentleman here in the first row. Yeah. We came to know many stories, ma'am, uh, after Rajiv Gandhi assassination. I think that if Manmohan Singh Ji, if Pranav Mukherjee Prime Minister, then Congress will not be different from the Congress. This is a very speculative question. This is the answer of the historians, the political analysts, they will be able to give it. This answer is not the answer for me. All right. I think that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, the gentleman here in the first row. Uh, Namaste, ma'am. I'm Nidhish Goel, the side. Uh, 2012-2017, Pranam Mukherjee Ji, Rashtrapati Rahe. And 2018, mein, he, uh, he went to Nagpur, uh, the RSS Vijaya Dashmi okay. Mahotsav. It was, it was just not normal. Okay. So, what is, what's your take on that? In the book, she writes a lot about this and also on how she opposed his going. But tell the story. Well, you know, that time I was fully involved in Congress politics and I was very, very opposed to his going. And I tweeted about this also. You know, it is in public domain. And, uh, and one of the arguments which was in circulation that time, that by going to uh, RSS headquarters, Pranam Mukherjee is giving legitimacy to RSS. So, for three, four days, there was like constant, like, uh, like I was fighting with him, I was raving, I was ranting. And he was absolutely quiet, only once he got irritated with me when I was repeating this argument that he is giving legitimacy. He just, who am I to give legitimacy to RSS? The people of India who have given legitimacy to RSS by choosing their, one of their pracharaks as the Prime Minister with a huge mandate. And in democracy, you know, you can't ignore people's mandate. And if you do it, it's only at your own peril. So anyway, it was over. And from RSS platform, ironically, he used RSS platform to preach Congress ideology. He talked about pluralism, he talked about uh, secularism, and he quoted there better know, uh, Pandit Nehru from RSS platform. When I look back at it, you know, when after his passing away, when I, and especially while I was writing the book, I felt he held on to his belief that in democracy, you just can't stop dialogue. You know, so that was, he was acting as per his beliefs. Okay. Somebody else? Yeah, the gentleman there. Hi, this is Manisha. Uh, simple question. What does a daughter plan to do to fulfill a legendary man's dreams? Okay. Quick answer. <laughs> well, you know, he, he did not create his legacy by asking me. So why should I be burdened with, <laughs> you know, fulfilling That's his dreams? That's a daring answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes, what? Uh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Dancer MP also was here. Okay, anybody else question? Yeah, over there. Hello. My question is, uh, when Pranabda was the uh, president of the country, did uh, Pranabda really wanted to leave the political arena and get into the presidentship and the various, uh, you know, presidential president he set up in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. How did you elaborate that? Sorry, I don't understand your question. What are you saying? Did he want to be president? Did yeah, he not? really. Is, did that he, your, is that your question? With, at his will, he wanted to leave the political okay. arena uh, on his own okay. and the Fair. president okay. he set at the okay. Rashtrapati Bhavan. Okay. I can only urge all of you to read this book because every single question that's come up today, she's dealt with in length. But answer it. Well, yes, of course, I think, you know, he wanted to become the president and uh, that was, you know, he was in public life for about 40 years. He achieved uh, whatever. He could not become the prime minister. Obviously, he desired to be the prime minister, but he also un understand and accepted uh, very well that, you know, he's not going to be. And uh, yes, I think the, uh, he wanted to become the president and fortunately, by God's grace, he did. Okay, that's a good <laughs> answer. Yeah, finally, sir, we'll give you a microphone, yeah. We have been knowing that Congress has been declining, as you said, from the Indira Gandhi downwards. Yeah. So, what Pranabda did to just stem that and to revive that, and anything is there in the maintenance of the diary? Was there any About idea? reviving the Congress. 
is a stem the decline and reviving okay. them what and did he want to do so uh, what did he actually do and what is his advice but same question well yeah, it's a yeah i mean uh, you see the decline doesn't become the manifest it doesn't become manifest in one day you know the causes of it maybe you can trace back to it uh, during uh, you know indira's time in terms of splitting of the party uh, centralization of the power uh, stopping organizational elections um, this nomination culture within the party so but you know it doesn't uh happen in one day i mean during indira gandhi had the charisma to carry it forward and get votes in his in her uh, name uh upa 1 upa 2 did very well for two years but by stitching coalitions but you know with coalitions uh, the party gets uh weakened the organization gets weakened so this is something you know i read in my father's diaries over the years and especially during upa 1 upa 2 and he, i wrote it also like you know he, he also told sonia gandhi that it will be much better to sit in the opposition rather than and be a strong opposition rather than be a weak government that you know are totally dependent on uh, the mercy of your coalition partners and strengthen the organization so you know there was this panchmari resolution of congress uh, uh, you know uh, where it was decided to uh, go alone do it alone and strengthen the party organization and even after you know like in 2014 you know like he wrote in his diaries that the only way forward is to you know restore internal democracy within the party uh, allow grassroots leaders at every level from the taluka booth to the state level to come up so these are organizational matters you know so this is the only way to uh, revive congress as per him okay. i think i have time for one more question yes sir go ahead yeah um I, my name is john elliot i was a journalist in delhi during these years if um, your father had become prime minister would he have wanted a gandhi to succeed him or would he have seen it as a way of moving india beyond the dynasty again this is a something very uh, speculative i will not be able to answer this and uh, but you know we have seen that you know after narsimha rao during narsimha rao's time he was a non gandhi uh, prime minister who lasted a congress prime minister lasted a full term but uh, then uh, within congress there was a i mean i mean with his relationship with sonia gandhi became pretty sour and then sonia gandhi you know came and again another congress uh, uh, gandhi nehru me, uh, family member became the congress president you know how my father would have handled it if he become if he would have become the prime minister to be very honest i really don't know uh, i will and you know because these kind of things are very i mean there are too many pros and cons you know how interested gandhi nehru pari parivar would have been to continue in politics if sonia ji would have for example said absolutely no very firmly when she became the congress president like earlier she refused what would have been the you know cause would i mean you know these are very speculative question i don't think uh, i can okay. answer that okay we are the end of our time given that your book is full of little sideways kicks at rahul gandhi <laughs> including you at one stage you call him a social media troll for the way in which he talks about savarkar remember yes. so given that do you think the congress will be better off looking for leadership outside the family definitely i think yes yes definitely right. yes okay so we have our headline thank you thank you so much